Welcome to Performance Anxiety. We analyze the film, television, theater, and comedy performances that everybody is talking about. I'm Alex Dale, and with me is my resident film expert, Marlon Tom. On this episode, we will be discussing Avatar The Way of Water, directed by James Cameron, starring Sam Worthington as Jake, Zoe Saldana as Neytiri, Sigourney Weaver as Kiri, and also starring Kate Winslet and Cliff Curtis. How are you doing? Oh, God. Yes. Good. But a bit coffee, so All right. I'm ready to go. So this is the background of this episode, is our cough. Yeah, very nice. Avatar The Way of Water is the sequel to James Cameron's massive 2009 blockbuster Avatar, as you may expect, which at the time was the highest grossing movie of all time, and the highest grossing 3D film, and the highest grossing IMAX film. And it had the highest budget on catering, I don't know. It probably <laughs> did. And yeah... There's no expense spent. Lots of money spent on expensive items. That's what we want to see. Now, The Way of Water, Avatar The Way of Water, has already taken $1.4 billion at the global box office. And it has overtaken last year's massive blockbuster, which was Top Gun Maverick, which was the highest grossing movie of 2022. Why are we interested in Avatar in particular? Which are the performances that we think need love and understanding? Or is there something in the nature of the performances themselves that needs more analysis and attention? Go. Well, the short answer is, of course, the motion capture performances. Tell that, me more about motion capture. Well, um, you know, motion capture is when all the actors become digitalized in a film, you know, like Andy Serkis did in uh, Planet of the Apes and as Gollum. Um, so they get all these kind of dots. Gollum in, in Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, yeah. Just for clarity. Yeah, so, so you know, you've seen all these images where actors get their dots painted on their faces and they wear all these kind of rubber costumes as as reference point for the computer to then put a digital mask on the actor, like a monkey or, you know, in, or in the case of uh, Avatar, the, the Navi. So the Navi are the... Um, well, what we would think of as human beings, the alien race on the planet Pandora. Yeah, but of course, they're not the alien race on the planet Pandora. They're the native race of Pandora. Of course they the are. aliens are the humans that are invading the planet. Excellent. So, with that in mind, what is Avatar The Way of Water about? Very the briefly. Way of water. The Way of Water. The Way of Water. Yeah, other than you just saying that <laughs> over and over again, <laughs> which I know it's cute, it's, it's very fun. <laughs> what is The Way of Water about? Very briefly. The Way of Water is the sequel to the first Avatar. In the first Avatar, the humans invade the planet Pandora for resources. But one of the marines... One of the invading marines. One of the invading... Well, the way they invade the natives, the navis, is by creating avatars and putting humans in these avatars to infiltrate the navis. This is one of the peculiarities of the film is these human beings, their soul, their essence gets transferred into a biological puppet that walks around like an alien yeah, so in the it, alien world. So in the second part, the human turned native, Jake Scully, played by Sam Worthington, played by Sam Worthington, who has been living on this planet in the peace and harmony with his family, with this Navi family for 15 years or something like this. And... They, uh, you know, they, they, they've they got kids and uh, he's been adapted, adapting well to indigenous life, so to speak. But now the invaders are coming back in the second film and the, their old enemy has also transported his essence into an avatar, Navi avatar, and is hunting Sam Worthington's family who have to flee from the forest environment of the planet to the water environment of the planet. The way of water. <laughs> and Are you trying to get a job in this movie or something? It's yes. already been made, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hence the way of water. They become refugees with the water people of the planet. The plot's actually not very important, I don't no. think, really. It's a pretext to show this amazing world. And I think, big picture, one of the things that I was always curious about... Um, why James Cameron makes the movies that he makes, I think is worth thinking about for a minute. What I finally understood through this movie is his <laughs> preoccupation is is hubris. Oh yeah, all his films are about humans, you know, going beyond their means and just getting it. Yeah, not knowing their place and then the, the human cost of that. So 
Uh, Terminator 2 was about the hubris of making machines that can fight back. Aliens is about the hubris of these marines going and getting their asses kicked by aliens. Titanic is about the hubris of the Victorians trying to make an unsinkable ship, and so on and so on and so on. It's always the same story. And the way he humanizes that is by showing usually a central protagonist, human protagonist, and how this massive hubris affects them and impinges on them subjectively. Avatar, The Way of Water, is no different. So it is the humans coming from Earth trying to raubbau, you know, rob the planet of its... Asset strip. Asset strip, that's the English one. Yeah. This very, very harmonious world that has apparently the solutions to all the world, Earth's problems. It's the world's tiniest, most pathetic MacGuffin is... <laughs> In the brains of these alien whales is some kind of substance that stops you aging. And yeah, it's, it's mentioned in <laughs> for about 30 seconds and then they forget about it again. It's so cute. It's either asset stripping or land grabbing. Oh. This idea of just kind of going out and hunting resources and just trampling on everything yeah, that's in the world. So, so apparently the humans on Earth could... Uh, come up with the technology of avatars, but not the technology of... To stop aging. <laughs> to stop yeah. aging. Doesn't... Or, or the technology of, of uh, cheap energy, which is... Let's okay. not pull at those threads, okay. right? Okay. We, doesn't matter. So, doesn't matter. Sp- suspend disbelief. Exactly. All fine. The plot holes in Avatar are massive, and but we don't buy into them because what he actually is, is he's a really, really good storyteller. Yeah. And the it's very easy to overlook all of those yeah. kind of plot illogicalities because it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't because it is a really fun film if you buy into it. Yeah. It's really well directed. These action sequences are brilliant. It's James Cameron. He yeah. does these things extremely well. He tells a good story. He, he tells really a good story. And so you won't be disappointed spending your £15 on the cinema ticket because you see all your money back on the screen. I think particularly in the last half of the film, the action gets really yeah. interesting and tense. James Cameron has spent millions of dollars building this enormous fantasy world, incredibly rich and detailed and so on. What is it about motion capture that's important in this process? What does it mean for the performances? Why is it important? So we must also say that James Cameron calls it performance capture. Interesting. He doesn't, he's changed the name from motion capture to performance capture. And I think that, that is really, really important. Well, for a start, it's right up our street. It's the Performance Anxiety <laughs> Podcast. Thank you, James Cameron. Oh, yeah, he loves us. <laughs> but what I think we need to talk about is the idea of digital cinema in comparison to photo realist cinema okay what, so when you're talking about photo realist cinema what are the specifics of that that you have in so mind? if you have if you imagine a cinema like normal cinema it, it is filmed through a camera lens and usually we imagine it being printed on film you know there is a kind of real relationship to the real world in what we see on screen so at, at some point a shutter has opened, the light has come off an object onto a piece of film. There's a At some point, there's a one-to-one relationship between what's happened and what's on the film. Yeah. So what semiologists call an indexical imprint of the real world. The trace is tied to the real thing. Yeah, the, like a footprint in the sand. So in photography, you have either the imprint on the chemicals on photographic paper or we can also imagine in digital photography, the imprint is the light going through the lens. I think that is almost equal in meaning. But what we have with a digital or a CGI created world is none of that reality relationship. So these worlds are generated. They're generated in a computer with no ref- no indexical reference to the real world. There's just, it's just the imaginations of the... Um, creators which are based in the real world but there's no real footprint of something so to record the trees they've not been filming trees they've just kind of computer generated one yeah so the animals they are sort of appropriations or imaginations of real life animals and they've been digitalized like dinosaurs in jurassic park okay so james cameron calls the process of motion capture performance capture What's that doing in this in this digital cinema universe? So he is something very interesting that he, in, I mean, he could have very easily created the navvies. Uh, the navvies the, being the aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the, 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 no, the natives. I beg your pardon. The natives. Um, it's, uh, I, I, sorry, just a digression, <laughs> but when I hear navvy, I always think of a guy who's working on the railroad in a donkey jacket because he's a navvy. <laughs> Carry on. Well, the green navvy, no, the blue navvies. 
And what, yeah, so James Cameron could have very easily created the aliens on a computer screen. So they could have been really just a digital invention. They don't, I don't think that he would have, the, the technology today is so good, you could have created a kind of photorealistic appropriation of what he imagines them to be. So he could have used a team of animators in a kind of Toy Story-esque way. So obviously James Cameron thinks there's something important about um, having a human being at some point in this process. What do you think that is? Or Tell me some more about that. Well, uh, what I would assume is that because he creates an alien race, but we have to feel invested in them. You know, like Susan Sontag writes about this kind of moral obligation we have with the photographic image, that when we see injustices in photographs, that we have to act morally on them. So by introducing this human element, this indexical imprint of a real human being, of a real human performance, and not just any performance, but a star. So these are real stars playing these avatar. You've got Sigourney Weaver, Kate Winslet, um, somewhere like, these are big names. Zoe so Saldana, yeah, massive stars. So you not just create a human connection with these kind of non-human beings, but you give them human essence and with it the kind of moral obligation of the audience to empathize with these and their plight. So the you make them human avatars in a kind of literal and metaphorical sense. The story only works this kind of accusation of human hubris if you empathize with the victims of it. Usually Cameron's victims were humans suffering from other humans' hubris. But here the, he's got a, a metaphor, the, the, the alien race. But they can't be. You have to, you can only, humans can only empathize with humans. That's a, that's a very fundamental thing. We can only empathize yes. in a human way. So the, the moral obligation that you're talking about from Susan Sontag is not like an external imposition on you. It's just something that you feel as a human being uh, almost subconsciously because we are social beings we have this connection with one another it's yeah. kind of it's not innate exactly because we socialize one another but it's important that you know it's not something we're feeling obliged to do from the outside it's something we feel from the inside a yeah. moral impulse like his story relies on the morality of the plot you know that you know who is the good guys and the bad guys but this is a very human understanding of morality is a human thing of course. creatures don't other things don't have morality animals don't have yes. it nature doesn't have it nature is not a moral thing nature does not have morality it's only what we instill in it yes and so he you have to um put humanity into these things for us to feel obliged to see the moral goodness of what he is talking about and this is why it's important for him to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars building these, the, the antithesis of all of these creatures is these machines. Imagining these machines, essentially it's a David Goliath story, but the bigger the Goliath, the more elaborate and the more expensive and the more overwhelming it is, the huger the hubris, the bigger the fall and yeah. the more the emotional resonance. Well, you can go through uh, James Cameron's films and the hubris gets bigger and bigger and bigger, doesn't it? As the, the budgets get bigger <laughs> and bigger. The more money, the more hubris. Yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. going to be the next thing? Um, probably, well, he's already doing planetary destruction, so I don't know. So the point of the performance capture is that it, we still need at some point some kind of connection back to a human being Yes, so for us to feel something. There's no such thing as nature as in its own terms, or there's no such thing as a morality outside humanity. And to try and show that morality will also work if we invade other planets, which doesn't work in the same way people imagine it to, because, you know, that's, that's not human. We, we have to make these alien ideas stand in for human beings. And so we are creating our own avatars. It is actually quite a nice philosophical experiment that he's doing. He creates avatars for us to think in avatars. Because we impose our humanity on other things. 
Okay, so thinking about the specifics of the humanity then and the performances that are being captured, how credible are the performances? Do you buy the Navi as having kind of a human essence, a human humanity behind this digital makeup that's been applied over the top? I found that the faces easier to empathize with than the bodies. The bodies are these kind of 10 foot tall blue. They're much more distorted. They're much more obviously false. And the way that they move through space and stand next to real human beings always seems really weird. How did you feel about it? As you say, I think the faces are the more interesting thing, especially the faces that are the most human bit. That is the lower jaw. As you said yourself, you could see Kate Winslet's performance once you saw, saw her jaw cleansing. Oh, yeah. that's Kate Winslet. When she was crying, yeah. it was like, oh, that's Kate Winslet's <laughs> crying mouth. <laughs> It's where it gets harder when it goes to the eyes, which is usually the point of identification. But it's got the Navis have got these very non human big eyes. So they have these kind of cat features. Yes. And so what is more human is, is the mouth and, yeah. uh, and the voices. So similarly with Sigourney Weaver, it has a very distinct underbite, kind of underbite and chin. And so in the film, her character is what would be a 14 year old human being, like an adolescent. And you can see physically a resemblance to Sigourney Weaver. But the peculiar thing is she has an old lady's voice. <laughs> yes, she has Sigourney Weaver's 60-something-year-old voice. <laughs> Which is necessary because it's Sigourney Weaver. You need the star quality of Sigourney Weaver uh, to, yeah, to, to recognize her, to have this connection with the character. And of course, you can make allowances. It's a non-human thing yeah 14 year old Navi yeah, sound no, like 60 year old women yeah can, I, I can buy this you me know? too that's not a, I don't have but it is odd but once you buy into it it's fine but these are the kind of things that you have to compromise on you cannot go for logic this yeah. is why you have to have these kind of illogical gaps in a movie like this you have to just buy into them yeah put on this I thing. think you know um, Way of the Water is a really interesting film it is a very good cinematic spectacle and it is a very interesting film in terms of what performances give to meaning you know in this case human performances give the aliens a humanity that is needed for the story what it means ideologically is, is a massive debate but this is performance anxiety it's yeah. not ideology anxiety exactly so let's leave it there do you think <laughs> oh, go and enjoy thank you for listening to Performance Anxiety tune in next time for more love and understanding of the performances that everyone's talking about Music